I was up in the Old Beans and uh, I was thinking about building a strip kayak. I'd seen some of those and seen pictures of them and they're just beautiful. And then he said, uh, and I'm thinking, that's, that's a lot of work. So I got talking with the fellows at Beans and he said, well, there's a fellow over there who races kayaks. And I uh, said, okay, and went over and I got to talk to him for a little bit. And he said, have you ever heard of Greenland kayaks? No, and he, and he handed me that book. So uh, I checked it out and said, this looks interesting, took it home. And, and these are a great winter project. So I said, well, I'll give it a try. So I cut the, cut my, kept my material costs down by using Douglas fir, which is quite heavy, but it, it's very rugged. And uh, so I built two, one for myself and one for my nephew. And then uh, my wife and I were down in Boston at a Red Sox game, and we came home, and the whole, we got home about 12 o'clock at night, and the whole neighborhood was just lit up, glowing. CNP was there. Well, we had a tornado, had gone through, and it took these two big pine trees that are two feet in diameter, crashed them across my pickup truck oh, no. and my kayaks. No. And it drove my truck literally into the ground. My rear bumper was two inches below ground level. When after I sawed up, I sawed up the trees, took them off my truck, and the truck did not come up. <laughs> so that that's that was my first two kayaks. And then I was approached by Noble High School and they asked me if I would teach a course for adult uh, continuing education. So I said, sure, and we, had, we built six more there. We, we got to use their wood shop, which the school was not using at the time. And I've been playing with them ever since. <laughs> and uh, you know, what you do is to start off with is, you know, how, what are the dimensions? What, Bob, Bob, do you all know Bob? No. Okay, my name is Bob Pease. Okay. I live in North Berwick. I've been known to go as far south as Berwick. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to just welcome you all to the Berwick Library and Bob for doing this great program and um, we're going to learn a lot about kayaks but let me just tell them a little bit about you which you've provided for me. Bob's a retired engineer having enjoyed years of hands-on design and equipment in electronic components for medical and aerospace industries. He's done mountaineering rock climbing, ice climbing, and he built his first boat when he was 16. Yes, flat bottom rowboat. <laughs> and used it on the Kennebec and Sandy Rivers. Bob is building this Greenland kayak with his grandson, Ethan, who lives down on the Cape in Massachusetts and plans on using it with his mom, Bob's daughter. So welcome, Bob. Peace. Thank you. That sounded pretty nice. <laughs> Wish I knew that guy. <laughs> well, uh, first off, you know, where would you start? You know, how, how big a kayak, how big would you, if you're an Eskimo or whatever, for rule of thumb, how would you build one of these, you know, starting from nowhere? Well, the Eskimos didn't have, you know, tape measures and rulers and squares and all that good stuff. So they came up with a formula that the, the boat would be three arm spans long. And then, uh, you know, as far as, well, how do you proportion things? Where would you put the ribs and the, the, the seat and everything else? Well, evidently, they went down to the lumber store and got a board like this. <laughs> and we need somebody, uh, and we need a volunteer to sit on this. We're going to do a weight and balance to find out where your sit bones are, where your feet would be, and whatever. So if we, do we have any volunteers? Hi. No, pointing at me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yes. <laughs> <Brought> my wife. <laughs> All right, am I sitting on this end? Uh, you're going to balance on that. If you could sit on it and get it to balance. And, and the most important tool I'm looking for is the old number two pencil. Mm. And actually, actually, I think this was the number three. Mm -hmm. That's easier said than done. You're pretty good there. Oh, now, okay. while you're doing this, you also want to make fists and put them under your knees. 
Yeah, okay, that'll that'll shift the weight that way. Yep. Oh, you're good. You're good. You're you're there. You you are there. And now <laughs> I've got a piece of ribstock here, but I'm gonna use it for a story pole. I'm gonna you can uh, relax, but th this uh, will mark down a a settle line. And then if you would reach back and feel where your hip bones, your sit bones are sitting. My hip bones? Yeah, where, where you, the, my the, butt. The butt, where your butt is going to hurt because these bones are sitting on the wood. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Probably right here. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to transfer that. I'm going to call that mark right there. And I'll call that SB for sit bones. Mm -hmm. Come back to the center. Now I'm going to take my seven inch high piece here and I'm going to place it up against your back okay. and I'm going to say that's where your back is. B for back. Okay. And with your hand, your fist back on your knees. Mm -hmm. uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> what happened? Your legs are too long. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to cut you off in the knees. <laughs> so you, you're here plus uh, two inches. So, plus two. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. We now have the critical dimensions for building a kayak for you. For this guy. All right. <laughs> and you notice everybody's different. If you get another person to sit there, the center of gravity is different, and uh, if you just they're quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. But if we transfer it, if we take the boat, the gunnels, and we mark the center point where it would balance, that's our uh, center point. And then here's your, uh, your back, your sit bones, and there's a little formula that says basically move back about four inches to get the center of gravity back. And okay. That's, these are the dimensions for your kayak, three arm spans long, and this tells you where certain things go. Like your footrest is going to be here plus two inches. Mm -hmm. It's going to be roughly there. And your, your back is here. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, your back is way back here. And, but that tells where everything goes in your boat. And then the, uh, the ribs are going to go about every six inches, except for where your heels are going to be, back here, you want to space it because you don't want to have your, your heels sitting on a rib as you're out there in the ocean for four or five hours. Right. And you don't want to be sitting on a rib. <laughs> right. But if you can sit on the bottom, it's actually like sitting on an easy chair because you're sitting on the skin of the boat. So that gives you, that tells you what the proportions are. Now, how do I shape that boat? I'm going to pretend these are the gunnels. And can I use, can I borrow you to you help me here? I need you to go that to that other end. And I'm going to go here and just put those. I'm going to pretend these are the chines. And they're going to go right inside there. And we're going to spread them apart. The, Slip these down a little further, something like that. Oh, that's perfect. We can set that right on the board here. And then we're going to put a spreader in the middle, which would be the width of your kayak. These are, happen to be 17 degree angles. And the idea is that these might not be long enough so they can actually do this, but the idea is to spread these apart. And once you get them spread apart and they're all at the uh, correct angles, then you've got to go back and pull, pull them in, give you that sexy uh, look where it comes like this and goes around and back in, that gives this, uh, instead of just being bathtub shaped, it allows them to come in. And then the, 
these uh, forms here, you got a cutout. And with that cutout, you can run a string from end, from end to end. And from that string, you can see, is it, are they even? You can just go to a point, you can measure if it's, say, six inches this way, six inches that way, that's good. If it's six and eight, that's not good. So then by moving your spreaders and your, your squeezes in, you get it all uniform. So you've got your gunnels all set. And then the next thing you need to do is, how am I going to maintain that? Well, you've got to, got to put deck beams in. And to do a deck beam, they come up with some very clever fixtures that I hope I brought. Oops, that's the guy that pulls the boat. No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I brought them. Hmm. Oh, yes, I did. Yep. This little chevron piece here is very clever. And if you clamp a beam, a piece of wood across here, top and bottom, and then by sitting this on the lower one and putting it against the side, you can mark the upper one. And that'll give you the, the length that you're going to want. So you just go down there, you mark it, Mark the other side, uh, both, the, these are compound angles. So by marking the beam on this side and the, and the following back side, then you get out your straight edge, play connect the dots, you get the, uh, the mortises for the deck beams that come coming through here. They'll come straight through and they'll be in the, the correct location and the upper part of the beam It'll place it so that it is uh, roughly three eighths of an inch from, from the top. And the, Are there deck beams on that now? Can you tilt it so that you? Oh yes. Sorry about that. Great. Thank you. See, these are the deck beams. And this one here has a different name, and uh, they kind of recommend you spend a lot of time in the woods and try to find some branches that are actually <laughs> the shape to cut it out of and. Uh, good luck on that. I've looked around quite a bit. <laughs> maybe some apple trees or something, maybe. But uh, and then these other ones I've just sawed out. These two here are curved. All the rest of them are straight. And this has no metal fasteners in it. There's no, you know, obviously they didn't have nails and screws. So everything is either tied together, they would use sinew, or, or, or doweled. And uh, my, my grandson was a, really had a good time using you know, electric drill, drilling holes and tapping in the quarter inch dowels and sawing them off with a little Japanese pull saw. These things are fantastic because you can, there's no set to them. So you, you saw, it cuts flush and uh, Everything will be flush, so when you put the skin over it, there will be no protrusions anywhere. So it's a very handy tool. And he didn't nick any fingers. Yeah. So you can see that the high-tech tools I've got here, you know, I've got a cheap drill and a Danish uh, oil for, for finishing it. You basically, if you I figure any place where this goes in, the water can't. So they're more or less waterproof, and it gives it a nice, it's a piece of art when you get done with it. It's really beautiful. I threatened my wife I was going to put it up on the wall in the living room, and <laughs> it didn't go over well. <laughs> and uh, you need string. You need a whole bunch of C-clamps because when you're positioning everything, it never wants to stay precisely where you put it. So you put it in place, put a clamp on it, 
put another one, clamp, 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 and then you go back and relocate them two or three times and after you measure them, <laughs> get it right. And the, the idea of drilling square holes, I went out and after I made the first few and uh, got a mortising tool to use on a drill press. And this thing is fantastic because it's been overheated a little bit, but it goes in a drill press. As you push down, it drills the hole and the shavings come out through the sides. So you drill a square hole. And I tell you, my grandson has just had a, so much fun with this thing. We built all kinds of stuff. We had a conglomeration with dowels and square pegs and stuff. And guess what? He gave it to his mom for Christmas. <laughs> the genuine thing with Jake. Be careful, it's very sharp. The square part gets pushed in. That'll fall out if you. What? Because it, it drills a circular hole and the square part like, kind of cuts down almost like a chisel? Exactly. Oh, it's, okay. So you hammer it down? No, it's on the drill press. Just yeah. bring oh, it down. Oh, okay. And it, it cuts smooth as can be. Even oh, cross grains. Yeah, it, this is all soft wood. Yeah, so with hardwood, yeah, it, it might be a different story, and you'd probably want to go a little slower. And I've learned you've got to leave the drill bit a little bit more proud sticking out, otherwise they overheat like this. Say that part one more time. Uh, if you get one of these and you want to use it, yeah. uh, the uh, upper part of the stock at the top of this is in a, like a tailstock, and you want to leave the center bit down just a little bit. And it doesn't heat up nearly as gotcha. much. Uh, yep. Okay, cool. It's a little practical knowledge, uh, slowly learning. And for the uh, for ribs, there's a simple formula that they have. And basically, you take a piece of paper and you come up two inches on one side, draw a line, the other side about five and a half, and draw another line. And then you count the number of ribs you have and divide that like 12 or 24, whatever the number of ribs you have, and then you add that to the space measured across the bottom of the gunnels. And that's the length of the rib stock. So, because how would you know how long to make the ribs? You know, because say it looks very simple, straightforward, but they're all different, they're all unique. And that's what they did. They just came up with a simple formula. <laughs> Draw a line and and then add that to the length of the pieces you're going across. Here's a piece of typical rib stock. It's just, that happens to be white ash, local. And uh, it's, you try to get the, the wood grain that's running straight up through here. Well, good luck. <laughs> so you're gonna probably break about 20% of what you make. And then these, I've come up with a, uh, a tool that I use with a router that I can thin the ends. Because you notice these all are about, oh, I forget how much the length of it is, but about probably eight or ten inches on the ends of the ribs are thinner. And there's a thicker section in the middle. And in order to get that, I just made a, took a router and I made a little uh, fixture that the ribstock would fit into that would hit the blade, it would cut until I get down to a certain depth. Well, if you happen to have a bridge port, that works nicely too. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and then same thing on the other end. And then for steaming them, you've got to steam these. Well, first you uh, put them in water. It's, any one of these plastic trays will work fine. Soak them for a couple days to a week or more. And then you've got to, you've got to have a steamer. You know, we have a high-tech device here. <coughs> piece of PVC pipe and a tea kettle. <laughs> I'm sure your wife loved that in the kitchen. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and she was even crazier about left, letting, giving me her meat thermometer. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a hole up there for, in the end for the meat thermometer. <laughs> and that, that usually runs about uh, 195 degrees. Get up the temperature and they take your rib stock that you've, you've cut and spent all this time and you tie a string to it and drop it down there, about 20 minutes. And then you get out your bending tool. If you're down cellar, this, this with a C-clamp fastens to the step of your cellar steps. <laughs> not OSHA approved, but... 
and then the uh, thinned stock is just plugged into here and uh, you just pull it around here it's hot tuck the other end in there and do the same thing and then you run over to the uh, chines and uh, the gunnels rather and you have already mortised the holes you've got all these square slots mortised into into here and you, you grab, you've got a hold of this warm pliable piece of wood and you just stuff it in here stuff it in there and sort of push it down and you got to do all the ribs all at once because you have to get your gunnel get your uh, keel to mate up with all of them or pretty close some of these at the ends <coughs> you'll always end up putting blocks in here spacers and uh, then once you get them in place they're all I drill holes through them you can put run these the string or the the nylon cord over them but if you do you're going to have little bumps you know and me being a high-tech super fast paddler I'm sure it would slow me down <laughs> maybe not and uh, so I, I drill the holes and lash them down continuously and you get them all lashed and these are doweled and no screws in here no metal fasteners then you saw it off because you have to fit this thing that's another operation that's interesting that uh, how you fit these uh, the they call them uh, cut water I think they call this they didn't call it a bow, bow piece whatever but then it, that is all tied in as well any glue at all definitely but it's not mentioned in the the book <laughs> but yes I definitely have some glue in here uh, this has glue under it and my I added a 3 8 spacer to this just to make it a little wider for my grandson to give it more stability so I've got glue in there and I actually used uh, I cut a notch across here this is TIG wire it's a 300 series uh, probably 316 or 304 stainless wire so it shouldn't rust it's very good stuff you don't want to use uh, 300 series stainless I mean you don't want to use 400 series stainless the stuff will rust but 300 series will not rust and uh, then I added these uh, they should fall I hope a little bit below the canvas well I guess they're not they're gonna the canvas is gonna hit them as well but I'm, I put these on here to give a little bit more stability for him because he's he's eight he's gonna be eight pretty soon this basically will be his birthday gift mm -hmm. <laughs> but he knows about it because he's worked on it so do you all feel adequate to be informed that you could build one of these now? <laughs> yes? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, obviously, this is, you know, a tremendous amount of knowledge that comes from your head. Do you have to follow it step by step? I'm sure sequencing plays a big part, right? The, you win. the book is fantastic. Um, it's very good. Um, my, mine that I have at home have really fallen apart but mine have notes all through them <clears throat> and if anybody's interested in building one if you're in anywhere near local uh, count me in I've got jigs I've got fixtures I've got C clamps I've got mortising tools uh, so if you're interested and uh, you want to do something like this, and actually this would make a great business for somebody if someone on the west coast there's, there's a place called skin boats Dot com and you go down there with your two weeks vacation and a couple thousand dollars in your pocket you walk in and you say I want to build a kayak and they will they'll work with you and you'll leave there at the end of the uh, the week with a kayak your tool back. Thank, thank you, you. Yep. Got it. thank you so it could be a business for somebody I'm not interested in going into business mm -hmm. if someone was I would I'd come over and I've got jigs and fixtures for doing some things that one of the things I left out is these gunnels are actually shaped 
it's a very simple procedure, but I've, I actually have a fixture you can clamp on there and take a router and cut these things out now. But uh, you can lay it out with a, with a flexible piece of wood and it's about, I think, 40 inches back to, to get the right curve and whatever. But the, those are minor details. And uh, so uh, then making the paddles, uh, basically it's, this, you pro, there's probably some formula to use. It, it doesn't really mention much. We say, I get a, a two by four and I just laid it out. I just said, well, okay, I want about yay much for gripping in the middle. Draw and set a line and come out equal, equally spaced. And then what's the diameter going to be? So mark there. Draw the line back to here. Well, I, now I want to make this a little wider back here, so I drew the line from here back to here. You know, just trial and error. You know, what, what looks good to you? And then I mark down here. I don't know if you can see the lines, but I've hit in about a half inch wide strip in the middle. So I marked two lines and basically uh, got out with my trusty draw shave. And just start whittling away. This stuff whittles very nicely, you know. This, and, and I also learned when you take those shavings off, don't throw them away or burn them. Take them to your library. The sewing courses, they put them inside little bags and makes, oh. you, makes your closet smell nice. <laughs> so you make some friends. <laughs> you know, all these other ones, I threw it all that stuff away, you know. <laughs> Not anymore. And here, here are the instructions. Uh, the width of the kayak, your butt plus two fists. <laughs> you know, your length of the kayak. Arm span times three. You know, don't even need to need the ruler. <laughs> then uh, this gets this gets more uh, complex. This is your what you do on the balance plank, the balance plank you know, yeah. <laughs> where everything goes, <clears throat> where do you start from, yeah. and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I obviously I'm I'm, I'm having a good time, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and there's <clears throat> you make a mistake, what difference does it make, you know, you know, you're not going to mess it up too much. <laughs> Keep going. Mm -hmm. and the, the book I want, I remember one of the books I had there that starts off with something to the effect of, don't worry, this is only your first kayak. Who would build more than one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How many have you built, do you think, over the years? Uh, I've, I, 10 or 12 I've been involved with. Uh, I built two, they got destroyed by the tornado. And then uh, two more, replacing those. And then uh, my grandsons, and we had a noble course, we built six there. So, I don't know. Adds up. Yeah. <laughs> so my first boat, not that it matters for this, but we had uh, lived on a farm up in Anson, Maine, next to the Kenny Beck and Sandy Rivers where they met. And I was probably I was probably like a freshman in high school, and I realized, gee whiz, we got two rivers and no boat. <clears throat> There's a wood pile there. <laughs> so that was became my first boat. It was a flat bottom rowboat, and uh, used that for years. You know. Painted it with house paint, you know. <laughs> it was fine. It worked for us. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I started you know, the house. We actually moved down to Dover, and I had a bicycle. And everybody, I used to pick up these outboard motors, and I realized that I fixed one. And then I finally came across a seven and a half horsepower Mercury. Ah, I need a speedboat now. So two sheets of plywood. I built a little pumpkin seed boat my own design, and on Lake Winnipesaukee, I could catch any boat on the lake by surfing their wakes. I, I couldn't catch them, but I could get on their wake, and I could surf their wake, and I could pull right up to them. I couldn't pass them, and I survived that, too. It's amazing. <laughs> it was eight feet long, and of course, we have to have, to have these uh, little devices. I gave my grandson a choice of whales or horse heads. He says, 
has to be a whale. I can't use a horse head on a boat. <laughs> so, we, so he's gonna. These will act after it's skinned. We'll have a whale pulling and pushing. We'll have two of them. So what, you mentioned skin. What's the process for the skin? Ah, thank you. Here's the skin. I'm gonna flip this over again. My family's been bugging me. When are you going to finish that? When are you going to finish that? So after the presentation. There you go. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, just to, for the fun of it, I went up and ran. I ran a 15K race this past week. And I've got one of these I use as a raincoat. I cut a hole in it. It's a trash bag from North Burke. So I was running white trash. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a front and rear of this somewhere. What is that? Yes, it is. This, it's nylon. It looks like uh, box weave uh, fiberglass, but it's nylon. Okay. So I've got a. I've done the so-called sewing on this end. So that will sit on there. Thank you. So basically, what you do is you fold it in half and put some uh, graphite down to the market with your number two pencil. That's the, the high tech tool you really need is that number two pencil. It's very handy for these projects. <clears throat> then you're gonna, gonna stretch that, pull it down and stretch it and do the same thing here, sew it. Then, then for cutting the material, I've got this high-tech knife. <laughs> it's a soldering iron. We've flattened it a little bit to make that into a knife. You can See what that looks like, and <laughs> okay. yeah, that's all you need. Then when you cut it; it uh, melts the edges, so it will not uh, unravel. And I think they're about five bucks. So as far as tools, uh, oh yeah, to, now once you get that round there, then you tip, flip the boat over and you pull it together and stitch it up as tight as you can. And then you start saying, gee whiz, that's kind of scary, it's pretty loose. You wet it, then you go, when your wife's not around, you steal her iron. <laughs> and you put it on high setting, and if, if it's wet, if it steams, the fabric will shrink permanently. <clears throat> So you, you shrink it up nice and tight, <clears throat> and then you get on the phone and you dial Corey in skinboats.com and say, I need uh, the two-pot urethane for covering it, and he mails it out to you, and with whatever color you want, he'll send some dye with it, <clears throat> and uh, then uh, you mix that, and you, you get up early in the morning, and you put three continuous coats over the boat. And you've got to be there all day because you think you're done and then all of a sudden you see a run. <laughs> you've got to be there to squeegee it out. You put the stuff on with a squeegee or one of those little foam rollers. You, uh, I haven't done the roller yet. I'm going to try a roller on this one. But I've always used a little plastic squeegee. And uh, keep applying and applying. Uh, the only thing I've left out is uh, the the combing you bend this with a around a form and drill a bunch of holes in it now I've said you don't use any metal fasteners but you really do because you have the boat the other side up and you pull the fabric up there and you poke a uh, sheetrock nail in there to hold it in place <laughs> so you use them to hold it all in place and then you take them out 
and sew it, sew the material. And so the fasteners go away. <laughs> and that's, that's how you attach that. And that. You pull up the fabric tight <clears throat> all around it. And then, then you actually put, the, put on the uh, two-pot urethane and it seals everything. And that's how you build a Greenland kayak. Yes. When you talk about sewing, are you hand sewing or do you do as much machine sewing as you can and then put it together by hand? Uh, it's all hand sewing. Okay. The needle, all oh, the sewing, you know, dental floss. Okay. So you want to do this, uh, well, you know, watch out for your teeth. <laughs> and the dental floss is very strong, it's very durable, and it'll take the urethane just fine. Yeah, you're welcome to come up and uh, check it out. This, this one, they're all stitched together and uh, put together the same way. Have you ever kept track of the number of hours it takes to build one? Like you yourself, have you documented how many hours it takes? I really haven't documented, but the first one, people would tell me that you can do it in 80 hours, easy. Yeah. First one was about 200 hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because I didn't have any jigs or fixtures, and it was, <clears throat> how do I do this? Back to the book, you know, upstairs. It's good for exercise. You go up and down the solid steps, <clears throat> and you get to that point, and then you start to realize, write in the book. Get a book, write everything in there, you know. And then you can do the next one. It's all already in there with the stuff you forgot. <clears throat> but then I think that right now, <clears throat> if I were... If I was going to do this as a business, <clears throat> I think I'd come up with a compromise on design and make them all be the same. You know, then, then you could standardize things, and I think you could probably knock them out in under 40 hours. <clears throat> but uh, your first one, I'd say two weeks, and it's a great winter project. <clears throat> when you're, if, you've, you know, down, if you've got a cellar or a like, garage is not really too, too great a place. It's probably too cold in the garage. But uh, the fabric, even the fabric, uh, they say when you put this on, you want to be below 50 degrees for the putting, when you put the fabric on. But the, my cellar is not heated. <clears throat> it's about 45 degrees. So I just wear maintenance, put the jacket on, long underwear, go down there and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and you know, these things here, they, they see, wow, how would you ever build that? Well, piece of plywood, and you, you can take some two by six or two by fours and make some, put some blocks that are going to be, that you're going to bend, bend around, and just screw them down or nail them down. And then you get your PVC pipe out and your tea kettle and your wife's meat thermometer, and you put the long piece in there and uh, just bend it around. And actually, this thing is, not difficult to make. And this one actually is from my, uh, one of my first kayaks that got destroyed. This part didn't get broken. Mm -hmm. So Ethan's going to inherit that. But what about the lift that's on it? It's, it's, ex it's, it's, exactly, it's exactly the same thing. It's just another piece wrapped around it. Is that two pieces or one? It's probably three pieces uh, or more. See, you know, this has a, see there's a seam right here? Yeah. It's just. Bend it right around. So that, that is one piece. Yep, you're right. Okay, but the top piece? Or is that... No, that's a separate piece. Oh, that's okay, that's a separate piece. Separate piece. over top. Yep. Okay. And then glued. Yep, so I do the, I do the inside first. Uh -huh. and then I did the outside. Hmm. And the tools, uh, <clears throat> if you don't have a bandsaw or a jigsaw, uh, the reciprocating saws over there, you can do most everything. If you go to the lumber yard and get the red cedar and whatever else, um, they've got nice equipment there. So if you walk in there and say, I want that piece, but could you cut it, you know, into two pieces this wide, or maybe three, get a, get the, get them to do the hard part. You don't have to have all this um, ability to cut. I uh, say a 16 foot piece of lumber's 16 and 16, you got to feed in, you got to feed out. So keep that in mind. So if you go to the, go down to uh, Lowe's or someplace to get a piece of Douglas fir or whatever, 
they're, they're nice enough. Hey, can I saw that for you? Sure can, sir. <laughs> and you don't have to have that table saw. That, that's a nice thing to know. Is that also made out of ash? Yeah, that is. That's white ash. Yep. They, they recommend, uh, I missed your thumb too. I did pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I didn't miss it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, red, uh, white oak is also recommended. Oh, cool. You go to, um, oh, what's a, back, Oakwoods Lumber. That's the ash came from Oakwoods Lumber. And uh, you can get oak over there, whatever you want. And it's, uh, it's not kiln dried. So you can soak it and uh, it'll, it'll work. Even if, you, even if you do use kiln dried lumber, you can soak it and it will work okay. So you haven't started cutting down your own trees? <laughs> <laughs> Tornadoes do that for me. <laughs> At least they stay in North Berwick. Yes, that's right. Yes, sir. The covering, you know, a lot of lakes, all the lakes, I think, in Maine have rocks, and I have a fiberglass kayak, and I've hit those many times. Yeah, uh, it, this is pretty durable. Uh, I don't baby it. Uh, I've, I've run into a lot of stuff. I, we, I have, at home, I've got two full-size ones, and uh, I go out on the rivers. We go over branches and sticks, and... Uh, I've I've had it hit the rocks, whatever, and I haven't damaged it. Right. Yeah, it's pretty robust, and you can also uh, get different weights. This is a lighter weight material. Uh, I think I forget just what how it goes, but I think this is about six ounces per square yard. And the uh, the first ones I started off, I was had those very concerns. I start off with 12 ounce per square yard. And that stuff is really heavy. It's called ballistic nylon. <laughs> it, is, it is tough stuff. And uh, the boats that got crushed, they broke up the wood and only one of them had a penetration. And there was a branch about yay big that went right down through it. And a nice two cornered tear it also broke the keel in three or four places, but but uh, the the skins are pretty tough. That that one there is made out of scrap material I had left over from other jobs. So you know, you're welcome to you know show and tell. I had a tree come down on my kayak and a branch pierced it. So a friend of mine took epoxy. The branch is still in there. It's only about ten three inches. High. <laughs> <laughs> Did he have one of these saws to cut it flush? <laughs> well, we didn't want to pull it out. I know, but just to cut it flush. Well, that would have worked. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the ceiling for the wood, you, uh, linseed oil, Danish oil, it works just as well. Danish oil is kind of pretty. Do you reapply that to the oil from time to time? Uh, you can. That's the beauty of it. If you use urethanes, you know, they're, they're horrible. Okay? You get these films that peel and you, you can't get them off. These things here, if it gets dull or whatever, just apply another coat and it comes straight back to life. So I, I love this stuff. Do you have to coat the inside of the nylon? It goes right through. Goes through. Yeah. That's, that's nice. And it, it also glues it to the frame. <laughs> So if you want to peel it off for some reason, like after the kayak crushes it, or the tornado crushes it, I've learned you can take an LP torch or an electric heat gun, heat it up, and you can peel it off. Otherwise, it just, it'll tear the wood. Wow. Yep. So that, that's, that's the final thickness. That was a spare for number 14. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's a spare, just a spare one. It's, and this, that one obviously is the same width all the way along, but the other ones, if you look inside the boat, they're thick in the center. Yeah, okay. uh, do you build it on a strong back? No. Nope. Just a flat surface? Uh, not even a flat surface. I use, a, I, it's a good question. Uh, you need a strong back for building uh, 
like cedar kayaks and strip kayaks, whatever. But for this, you do not. Uh, and you can, you can build them with more or less rocker. That's the curve of the keel. And if you want a boat that's going to maintain a course, <clears throat> you don't want much rocker to it. If you want it to be quite maneuverable, then you want to build it with more of a curve to the keel because it'll turn easier. And no matter which way you build it, it's going to be wrong because, because you're going to be in conditions where you want, to, want it to have the other properties. <laughs> so <laughs> there are no right answers. There are no wrong answers, therefore. <laughs> So, on that extra one, you have little outriggers. Is that typical? Or? No, that's that's the only one in the world that I know of. Oh, okay. okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> that was built for a two-year-old. Uh huh. Okay, and gotcha. So my grandson's been paddling since he was two. Uh -huh. And there's a lady down in Summersworth who does laser markings. So if you cut out little wooden plaques, you can put the any anything you want to write in there. You know. So this new kayak has got um, says to Ethan from Grandpa you know, his birthday on it, and the other side, to make mom and mom happy, it's got emergency numbers. <laughs> 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 so we've, we've, we've covered that, we think. Do you usually wear a skirt with, with these ones? Or? That, that is what that is made for. That's that rib around yeah, the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do have skirts, yeah. and I've used them. And, uh, yeah, but... Yeah, I, I, I've, I've taken the course, but I'm not confident. You, you younger kids here, you, you can do that. You, you'd be great. Yeah. And, and the book, come to the library, pick up this book. It explains how to do the rolls. There's everything in that book. It tells, you know, how to, basically how to make a little spear thrower and make it wide so you can use it to do your rolls with, too. And then we're going to put, I'll put um, bungee cords across the deck. Because when you're out there, you want to stop for lunch, you've got to tuck your paddle in there and uh, be comfortable while you're sitting there. And you what do you attach the bungee cords to? to uh, what you do is, uh, after it's skinned, you just drill a hole, probably about 3 8 oh, okay. and uh, you put your bungee through there and just tap a wooden plug in beside it. Then it'll squeeze it and then they stay right in there. It, gives my, it kind of stops my heart every now and then when I'm out there, instead of grabbing the kayak by the, the bow or the stern, people reach over and grab the bungee cords and start walking with it. <laughs> but so far, none of them have come out. <laughs> oh, here's some uh, you know, major fixtures here. If you want to draw a line across a piece of wood, Three-eighths up, just put your number two against it and run along. And if you want to line one inch up, there you go again. You know, simple little fixtures that are explained in this book. This book is really nice. It's, it has, you know, it answers lots of little questions that, that you're going to show up in your mind later on. And it gives you three or four different ways of uh, doing things, like his shaping the the gunnels. You can you can do it with a chisel or a draw shave or you can saw it out on a band saw or use your reciprocating saw. There are many ways to tackle it and that's the fun of it. You know, it's lifelong learning. <laughs> that's what life is all about. It's have fun and uh, do stuff and experiment. If, if it isn't right, well, blend it. <laughs> Make it work. Just by doing it, uh, I'm, I've, the, you know, career-wise, I was, uh, I worked in aerospace, well, I started off working for Boeing, then I got into electronics, worked in uh, medical uh, components, uh, tantalum capacitors, and working in stainless steel, and designing product, and put the other hat on, you work with a, as a chemical engineer, because that's what you need, and I was fortunate. I worked for a small company. I had to wear lots of hats, and uh, I just enjoyed it. You know, having fun. You know, I went to school nights. You know, I started off with uh, at Wentworth Institute. Then I went to UNH nights for years. Where 
had a kid driving back and forth from Biddeford to over to Durham, and yeah. And then uh, since then, uh, just different hobbies. I fix up old cars. I've got a MG that uh, I've got a '76 MG that I restored from the bottom up, and I've got a TR3 now that I'm fixing. I hope to on the 21st we're gonna swap out the steering box and yank the gas tank and clean all the rust and crap out of there, a little muriatic gasset and chains and nuts and bolts to get the rust out of that. So just being a Yankee, you're from Maine, you know. Buck it up, do it. <laughs> you don't know how to do it, you know, go to the library. <laughs> so there's no moss under your feet. No, uh, I, life is to be lived. You got beaches, run the beach. Uh, it's, uh, last Sunday I was running a 15K up at Sugarloaf. And we call it running, but uh, there's a lot of walking involved. <laughs> Had a lot of fun. Uh, me and another friend of mine, that we, we did that. and Stay healthy, keep working. If you don't want to stop learning or physically, because uh, either one of them will do you in. Keep busy. Didn't do pro and we just built uh, some birdhouses, my grandson and I. We built a bird hotel. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, big, big, tall one in the middle and four around it. And, and <laughs> so that was another Christmas present for mom, you know. <laughs> and he, he got to use the electric drill to you know, screw it together and we painted it. And there's all kinds of things. And I just came back from Walmart. I just bought him a jackknife, you know. As a, we're going to get him a jackknife. He's going to learn how to whittle. We get some of these nice soft woods. And the jackknife stays in Maine, but <laughs> don't take it to Boston. <laughs> but uh, he's got to learn how to do the stuff. And yeah, mine, mine healed. <laughs> your, your finger and your thumb is going to heal. It's getting there. You're learning. <laughs> so any questions? Is it all either red cedar or ash? Are those the two woods you use? Uh, there's pine in here, there's spruce, oh, cool. there's hemlock. Oh, wow, cool. Yeah, whatever, whatever was around for picking up parts and pieces to make deck beams out of because they have to be strong enough to hold you while a piece eight inches long will support you. And if it doesn't, it probably the kayak would flip over anyway. <laughs> so it's pretty strong and you could some of my other boats, I've routed out the center of the beams and made them more, more like an I-beam to, to reduce the weight, you know, quote unquote. It just doesn't amount to anything, but it was fun doing it. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so you can try uh, all kinds of different things, different experiments, and you don't require a, you know, a whole big wood, woodworking shop. I've got a table saw and a band saw that is not OSHA approved. But uh, whatever I do is use the bandsaw on, I could have used that reciprocating saw. <laughs> Bandsaws are scary. <laughs> they don't, they're not forgiving. So uh, that's much more forgiving than a bandsaw. What do you do for float bags? Have you tried making your own? Oh, no, no. Float bags, it's called uh, milk containers. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Each one is 7.3 pounds of flotation. So this boat, when it's completed, will weigh about 20, 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. So you stuff a few gallon yeah. milk containers in there. That'll you know, that. Yeah, that'll do it. Show you all that work you didn't have to do, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> say a milk jug. And, and this book here explains how to do, make flotation tanks. Everything is in here. Yeah. It's, this book is really amazing. For, for, if anybody's really considering making one, it's got, uh, it even shows you how to make a collapsible kayak wow. in here. With the, uh, <clears throat> and it, it shows you how to make the clo clothing to wear. So if you're out there in January and you roll it, you know, they, how do you see? They've got the clothing wow. cool. that you can wear in there, not freeze to death or drown. Or, no, thank you. Don't show that to your grandson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he's going to try that stuff. We, we tried it all when we were kids. You can put a keel on it. Uh, do they have any designs for multi-person boats? Or do they 
No, no. The kayak means hunting boat. <laughs> it's a singular thing, I guess. But it is your spear thrower. <laughs> you know, it's got it's got all kinds of stuff to get your imagination. Flotation device. After you kill that seal, you've harpooned him, you hitch this to the other end of that harpoon line, and let him drag it around for a while. <laughs> and it shows how to make the flotation, how to make the, the clothing to wear. It's got a little of everything in it. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. They're not meant to be used in white water or small because yeah. they're, they're long and narrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice. I had a lot of fun. Can we look at a few of the Oh, please. Yeah, help yourself. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. It's here for show and tell. Thank you. <laughs>